In this lecture, I'm going to talk about Thomas S. Kuhn. He lived from 1922 and died in 1996. Let me explain, first of all, just what the plan of the lecture is going to be. I'm going to, first of all, to say a few words by way of introduction. I'm then going to turn to some of Kuhn's key ideas in his best-selling work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. After talking about them, I'm going to say to you something about Kuhn's own path to these ideas, how he got to the ideas for which he's best known. I'm then going to turn to the issue of their reception, what other people made of them, and then I'm finally going to turn to some of the implications of Kuhn's views and to some open problems with which they lead us. Let me then say a bit by way of introduction. Who was Kuhn? Well, he was an American historian of science and a philosopher, and he was the author of the million-plus bestseller, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Now, million-plus may seem no terrible big deal, but you may be thinking in terms of uh, best-selling novels and so on. For an academic book to sell a million, well, all I can say is I'm an academic author and my works typically are published at the level of 2,000 copies. So this gives you some, some feel for the kind of impact that he's made. Kuhn's name may not be all that well known. But I think some of his ideas are, for example, the term paradigm and the term paradigm shift. You'll often come across these used quite widely. In this lecture, we're actually going to look at what Kuhn meant by these things. In addition, the picture that he gave of what scientists are like has been in some ways quite influential, namely a picture of scientists as being relatively uncritical workers within a particular tradition or framework. Kuhn's work led to a striking reinterpretation of science, and it's led also to much important and interesting research. But it also, I think, leads to some important and really quite thought-provoking problems, and with these we're going to be dealing as well. Let me turn, however, to really the heart of his views, the structure of scientific revolutions. In order to appreciate the impact of his work, I think we need a picture of what people thought about scientists prior to Kuhn working. Because to, to appreciate the impact of Kuhn's work, we need really to understand that, these other ideas by way of a contrast. One might sum up the kind of picture that people had of scientists prior to Kuhn's writing in roughly the following terms. First of all, a scientist is open-minded, and he or she is the sort of person who practices divergent thinking. They're the sort of person who's got, you know, imagination will look at things in different kinds of ways. Next, the traditional view is very much that what characterizes the scientist is that he or she bases their claims upon evidence. Next, they may see the content of their ideas as having been drawn from experiments, or perhaps, say, if they've read Karl Popper's work, may stress the significance of testing. And in addition, science was very often seen as cumulative, the building of science as being a little bit like the building of cathedrals, where one person sort of lays the foundations and other people build up. One might add to this that science was often seen as a kind of paradigm of rationality, uh, as being a rational enterprise that people might look at for inspiration in other areas. Now, in two talks, one given in 1959, Kuhn signalled his disagreement with this kind of picture. In the talk given in 1959, what Kuhn stressed was the role of convergent thinking and of tradition in science, as saying, no, it isn't the case that scientists are open-minded. There's a sense in which they are closed-minded. And indeed, in the second of the talks given in 1961, the main point of it can be seen from the title of the talk, which was the function of dogma in scientific research. And it's from this sort of notion that you can get some feel for the kind of contrast between the sort of picture that Kuhn was offering of science and the more ordinary view of science as an open-minded enterprise.
what was going on. Well, Kuhn's ideas are set out in his structure of scientific revolutions. Kuhn there offers an account of typical developments in the hard sciences. He's dealing really with the physical and biological sciences along the following lines. He says, look, typically in the development of a scientific discipline, there is initially uh, a period which is not really science. It's a period of pre-science. In these areas, there will often be diversity. There will be debates about fundamentals. There'll be people championing different fundamental ideas. What's more, such teaching as goes on in these areas will, again, be concerned with debates and uh, controversies between these different approaches. And indeed, Kuhn made the point that many of the social sciences still operate in this way. There is a sense in which, and I can illustrate it from my own background in political science, if students are studying political science, what they will often do is be it, uh, introduced to different key works in different areas, to different contending approaches, and this is seen as the basis of education. For Kuhn, and this is really what's distinctive, Science proper begins when critical exchange of this kind stops. Kuhn's view of a mature science, rather, is that it involves two things. It involves, on the one side, what he calls puzzle solving, taking place within a paradigm. This activity of puzzle solving within a paradigm, Kuhn calls normal science the typical scientific activity. Let me explain these two terms uh, in order. First of all, paradigm. This term, for which Kuhn is best known, has a variety of meanings in his work. They range, for example, from a worldview, a sort of conception of what things are like, within which particular sorts of science are conducted, through, for example, Influential models are examples that something may be taken as typical or really good scientific work and other people try essentially to use that as a model for their work elsewhere. Kuhn also stresses what are the standard views and assumptions in any particular branch of science and he talks about this in terms of a paradigm as well. Indeed, a critic of Kuhn's complained at one point that she thought that Kuhn had used the term paradigm in something like 21 different ways. And Kuhn actually took this to heart, and later, in the light of this criticism, he said, look, I can clarify what I was talking about when I was using the term paradigm by splitting it into two separate things. On the one side, there is the notion of an exemplar. Namely, a piece of work in a particular scientific discipline that then serves as a model for other work. This may be material, for example, that if people are learning a particular science, they're introduced to this stuff as a model, and then what they have to do is to try, essentially, to replicate that kind of approach, but applying it to different sorts of material. On the other side, there is something that he uh, termed disciplinary matrix. This is really a view of the world and indeed a view of what an explanation should look like. What is particularly characteristic of Kuhn's approach, however, is that on his account, the disciplinary matrix and indeed an acquaintance with exemplars are something that people acquire as a result of their learning a particular scientific discipline to the point where the disciplinary matrix may be something that they're not actually conscious of holding in a particular or distinctive way, but it's what they come to take on board, as it were, as a result of having worked over the various examples and issues which are standard in that particular path of scientific education and in that particular scientific community. The practitioners of these disciplines indeed may not even be conscious of the fact that they have particular views, particular expectations about things. An analogy here might be that uh, for those of us who've grown up in an, in an English-speaking background, if we're not aware, if we haven't come across when we're young, people speaking other languages, we may not really be conscious of the fact that we're learning a particular language. Another example might be table manners, that we may think, you know, there is just one way to behave, and not really being aware of the fact that other people do 
do things differently. Now, in a similar way, what Kuhn is saying, and this really feeds back into his notion of a paradigm, is that what people are acquiring through their education, what they're acquiring through their socialization, is a particular way of looking at things, which other people don't have, but where they may not be aware of the fact that other people don't share it. What then about puzzle solving? Well, this characterizes for Kuhn normal or usual scientific activity. What he depicts is the typical task, the normal task of a scientist, as being filling out a paradigm. The paradigm essentially offers a kind of blueprint for how the world is to be understood, and the typical activity of scientists on Kuhn's account is filling this out of applying the paradigm to puzzles, to issues that haven't yet been looked at, but under the expectation that the world can be understood as the paradigm suggests. And indeed, the term puzzle solving was used by Kuhn just to bring out the way in which the normal expectation is that the tasks which people are working on within the paradigm are ones which they would be expected to be able to solve. It wouldn't be just a mechanical exercise, as it were, but just like if one is trying to do a jigsaw puzzle, then if you can't actually fit the pieces together, that basically shows you're no good at doing jigsaws, not that there's something wrong with the jigsaw. In a similar kind of way, Kuhn's picture of the normal scientist is using, you know, a certain amount of creativity and so on, hard work. Not everyone is going to be able to do it, but if they can't do it, if they fail, then that's a black mark against the investigator rather than something that is calling the paradigm into question. Indeed. Kuhn also stresses the way in which, on his account, scientists see the world in terms of the paradigm. They see things through the paradigm rather than just seeing things objectively. One sees the world through one's training, through one's expectations of the kind of explanation one's going to be able to produce. However, over time, on Kuhn's account, there is gradually an accumulation of anomalies. It just may be the case that, you know, various people find that they can't actually do something, they can't really resolve a problem that they were expecting to be able to resolve in terms of the paradigm. Gradually these things accumulate. The fact that someone has not been able to solve such a problem doesn't knock the paradigm out at all. Rather, people just go on with the work noting that this hasn't yet been accomplished. But gradually these unsolved puzzles accumulate. And what happens in the end is that people make variations within the paradigm trying to find ways to accommodate these. And so one may look at the paradigm as being something like a shared language, but you find in this period when uh, these anomalies have accumulated, you may get to a situation where there are growing divergences between what people are trying out up here and what people are trying out up here. This, in turn, leads on Kuhn's account gradually to a paradigm breakdown. And what happens then is that one gets people looking at books in philosophy, having debates about methodology, discussing some of the differences, saying, well, should we look perhaps at this different area for inspiration for different kinds of ideas? This leads to diversity and to what Kuhn calls extraordinary science. This isn't the usual science. It's something that happens when the paradigm is breaking down. But from this extraordinary science, from this flowering of various different ideas and approaches, there then emerges a new paradigm which, within which new sorts of normal science are set up. What is crucial, though, on Kuhn's account is that the move from one paradigm to another is, as he's described it, like a so-called gestalt switch. I don't know if you've seen, that probably the best illustration of this, are these pictures where there may be a candlestick and two pieces of white on either side where it's possible either to see the dark candlestick as a candlestick and two bits of white space, or you may suddenly see that there's another way of looking at this material. You may see it as two white faces, and what had hitherto been the candlestick simply becomes black space in between them. And what one gets and what's characteristic of this is that there's a sort of flip-flop back and forwards. It isn't the case that there's a kind of neutral experience of the world, and then you can just see one interpretation rather than another. Rather, you see 
things, either through one interpretation or the other, and that at a certain level the world itself actually seems to change when you go back and forth. And this, Kuhn said, is what is characteristic of a paradigm shift. And indeed, he stressed the notion that there is what he called at some points incommensurability between the different paradigms. Namely, he thought that one couldn't make a rational comparison or appraisal of these things. Rather, in a scientific revolution, you may find that there are some people working on the previous paradigm and other people working on the new paradigm, and they really don't have any way of talking to one another. They may say, well, we don't understand, you know, why you're still bothering with those problems and those concerns, we're now doing something new. Let me now say a little bit, because I think it helps to illuminate what's going on, about Kuhn's path to these ideas, how he came to these viewpoints. Kuhn himself was, by training, a physicist, and he received his PhD from Harvard in 1949. While he was there, before he graduated, he was asked if he would lecture on the history of science. And when he was doing this, when he was doing some research on it, he was struck by the real differences that there were when they treated motion between Aristotle on the one side and Isaac Newton on the other. After studying this issue, Kuhn came to the conclusion that it wasn't really very helpful to see Aristotle just as being wrong. Rather, what was going on was that he wasn't, wasn't so much that he was wrong, but that what he was doing was different. And indeed, Kuhn's approach to the history of science became that what one needs to do is to be aware of the fact that the world was seen and things were understood at different times, really in quite radically different ways, and that the task of the historian should be to understand these kinds of differences and the changes that there were across history. He was after a sympathetic understanding of these different views. His concern then became, indeed, with the different conceptual frameworks that there had been at different times in the history of science, and in changes in these frameworks, in so-called scientific revolutions. Kuhn explored and set out some of his ideas about this in a book that he published in 1957 called The Copernican Revolution. This told the story of the dramatic shift from a view of the universe in which, to start off with, the Earth was taken as fixed at the center of the universe to an understanding of things in which the Earth was in motion round the Sun, and later on to Newton's ideas. It's a story of dramatic changes in our understanding of the world, really that the world seemed to be turned upside down, not just of changes in science, but also changes in, in, in textbooks and in views of things more generally. Kuhn's view at that time was of science is increasing its scope, sort of covering and dealing with more things through history and through changes in these conceptual frameworks. But he was concerned in the sense that his account seemed at odds with rather more usual views about scientific change. They tended to stress very much the role of confirmation or disconfirmation in the history of science. It seemed to Kuhn that scientific change wasn't just a matter of these kinds of things. Rather, he noted what he referred to as bandwagon effects of in the and changes in the views of the scientific community, things which were much more like changes in fashion rather than just responses to uh, empirical observation. And indeed, his structure of scientific revolutions was his own later theory of how one should understand these changes in this sort of phenomena. Let me turn now to the reception of Kuhn's work, because I think this points out in quite an important way why, on the one side, Kuhn's Im uh, impact has been so great, but also why one finds somewhat divergent attitudes towards it. On the one side, there were people who, one might say, had what I called the, before the traditional view of science. And this indeed included many working scientists. Kuhn made, I think, an immense impact on them. First of all, he brought home to them the immense importance of theoretical perspectives, indeed of paradigms, and the role of conceptual frameworks within science. And this really led to quite a change in people's orientation if they had, up to that point, simply been seeing science as derived from observation. He also introduced the terminology of paradigm and normal science, and more generally the kind of ideas that we've been talking about before, 
And he also emphasized the point that in science there is revolutionary and discontinuous change, changes in paradigms. And this again came you know, as, as earth-shattering for people who hadn't really been thinking in these sorts of terms. A second kind of group reacted to him in rather different ways. These were often people who were specialists in the philosophy of science, for example, some people who'd been influenced by Karl Popper's work, um, but other people who were sort of more up with discussions in the philosophy of science. First thing to be said here is that a lot of what affected the first group of people really was rather old hat to this other group of people. Rather, what was new for them was that Kuhn seemed to be calling into question the possibility of scientific progress. His account of scientific change, including bandwagon effects and changes in fashion, seemed to call into question the idea of science as being, in some sense or other, a rational enterprise. And this is really important just because science had often been seen as the exemplar, one might even say the paradigm of rationality, so that people in other areas, in society, in the social sciences, might be looking to the natural sciences to see what a rational approach was like, and Kuhn seemed to be calling this into question. These people in the second group were also worried by the following. Kuhn seemed to be offering an account of scientific change as purely or largely a sociological phenomenon. Imre Lakatos, a Hungarian-born philosopher of science, a critic of Kuhn, said, you know, on Kuhn's account, scientific change is a matter of mob rule. I mean, it seemed, it seemed as it were that Kuhn's account of scientific change made changes in science about as rational as changes in hemline or something of this kind. Kuhn also seemed to suggest that one could disregard problems could disregard critics in science because a key thing about seeing the failure to solve problems just as anomalies means you could put them to one side and get on with your work because under the assumption that someone will get them right a bit later. And indeed, uh, conceptual problems that were being brought forward, claims about inconsistencies, empirical problems, Kuhn seemed to say these could quite legitimately be poo-pooed so long as people were going on exploring the paradigm. It also seemed as if Kuhn was legitimating relatively uncritical normal science and rather dogmatic education within science. So that there were some people who said, we're rather concerned about scientists just being taught almost by rote, just being uh, uh, working on particular models and how these are to be applied, not really thinking about alternative approaches, not thinking about the broader context of their work. Kuhn seemed to be saying, but this is a necessary feature of science if people are going to get on and explore paradigms. Indeed. What seemed to this group particularly worrying was not that Kuhn said that this is how science was, but also Kuhn seemed to be saying that the account that he was giving was an account of what science ought to be like as well. Because clearly, if Kuhn's account was accepted as an account of what science was, one might say, well, we need to move in and reform it. But Kuhn wasn't saying that. He was saying, we need normal science. We need relatively uncritical, uh, uncritical uh, uh, scientific activity and so on. There was a third group of people, though, who reacted to Kuhn in quite a different way yet. These were often people who were working in the history and the sociology of science, studying its history, studying its sociology. They welcomed and indeed tried to take further than Kuhn had a purely sociological approach to science. They said, yes, what we have to do is to see science simply as the practice of a particular culture. You know, people over here do things in this way, people over here are scientists, people over here are doing things in a different way. There is simply diversity. This older model, really, of uh, science as being particularly distinctive was by them junked. And indeed, they took, ex they took Kuhn to be questioning the image of science as a distinctive example of rationality. They saw and interpreted and indeed welcomed Kuhn's views as introducing a kind of cultural relativism. Kuhn himself, I think, was a bit horrified by this sort of move, and he wanted to distance himself from it without, it seems to me, ever fully managing to explain, certainly to the satisfaction of the second group, the philosophers of science, how that kind of consequence was to be avoided as an interpretation of his work. Let me indeed turn now to the issue of the implications of Kuhn's work and to open problems. First, some problems about Kuhn's approach. Kuhn, as I've indicated, himself repudiated relativism, but I think he didn't really make fully clear the sense in which there could, on his account, be progress within science. 
Some people said, well, actually, there is a way in which one can understand this. It'll take a little bit of explaining, but let, let me do this. They said Kuhn's account is okay if one treats it as a so-called non-realist approach to science, namely of saying what science is doing is giving you conceptual frameworks or systems of classifying things rather than account an account of what the world is actually like. To understand what's at issue, let's consider the Copernican revolution and the contrasting views towards that of Galileo on the one side and of the Catholic Church, say Robert Bellarmine, Cardinal Bellarmine on the other side. Cardinal Bellarmine took the view that Copernicus's ideas about the earth being in motion were in a sense no big deal because he said, well, we just interpret these as offering us a new way of representing things and a new way of making calculations rather than treating it as an account of what was actually going on, of the earth in fact being in motion. Whereas Galileo, by way of contrast, wanted to assert that the earth was actually in motion. If one takes a view like Bellamine's, then what may otherwise look a bit like relativism actually isn't a big deal, because from this kind of perspective, paradigms and so on aren't about the world, they're just ways in which we classify our experience. I mean, it's a little bit like someone changing a classificationary system in a library. You know, there's no big deal about how one, do one does that just on the basis of convenience and so on. But if by way of contrast with this, you take the kind of view that Galileo was wanting to take, of science is actually dealing with what things are really like, then an account like Kuhn's seems to be very problematic. And so some people have said, well, this stuff about relativism in Kuhn isn't a big deal because one can take his paradigms as simply being conceptual frameworks, not accounts of what things are actually like. But even there, I think, there are problems because if one does take that kind of non-realist view, it still faces a difficulty that Kuhn's work raised. Namely, it faces the problem that's been subsequently referred to as Kuhn loss. What's this all about? Well, at one point in Kuhn's work, he talks about the way in which, through changes in paradigms, one finds that some of the content of science, some of the details, are lost between one paradigm and another. And that really isn't going to be acceptable if you just see what, what want to see a stability in science as being a matter of the accumulation of such material and then the uh, changes as being changes in conceptual frameworks. Kuhn's views also run into all kinds of philosophical arguments about incommensurability and about ambiguities as to how his views are to be understood, how we're to understand the relationships between the world and our perceptions of it, and there's ongoing argument about this. In my view, for what it's worth, Kuhn's ideas are immensely fruitful and immensely exciting. They lead us to a concern with the actual history and sociology of science. This by some people who said, well, this is at odds with those people who are concerned with the appraisal of our knowledge. Um, namely, those people who've got normative concerns, concerns with how things can be improved rather than just descriptive ones. I think, though, that we need both. I think that we can't get away from the need for a normative approach for appraisal, for example, if we're trying to assess uh, what we should make of some new approach, uh, say, an economics-derived approach to politics. Uh, one can't just describe, one has to appraise. At the same time, I think, those people whose concerns are with normative stuff have to pay attention to sociological and historical issues like Kuhn has suggested. I think the two views really complement one another. But this, though, isn't a matter simply of adding them together. At certain points, they're at odds, and one needs to resolve the differences. One can, for example, be led to compare the kind of views that one gets in Kuhn's work and in Popper's approach, about which I've spoken in an earlier lecture. Kuhn takes a sociological, not a logical approach to science. But there's surely a need for both. If one wishes to improve our knowledge, one must, as Edmund Burke would have stressed, start with people as they are. Next, Kuhn has stressed the importance of normal science. But for Popper, normal science is uncritical. It's too ready to accept the status quo. Popper was also concerned with over-narrow, over-specialized scientific education and concerned that Kuhn thought this was normal and acceptable. Those who follow Kuhn would say that Popper has to give an account of continuity in science and of the role properly played in science by tradition. What Kuhn, what, from Kuhn's perspective, what Popper is, is stressing is uh, things which are extraordinary, which only occur on a few occasions. Science for Popper also is a matter of aspiring to truth. 
and Popper is a scientific realist. He refers to Galileo and takes that viewpoint. Kuhn is somewhat ambiguous about this issue, and I think that those who favour his perspective really owe us an account of what exactly one's to make of Kuhn in this area. All told, it seems to me that if we're interested in, in improving things, we need to bring these different concerns together and resolve problems at issue between them. On this, there's a lot of work still to be done. To conclude, Kuhn has introduced a valuable new perspective into science. It's led to valuable work in the history and sociology of science. It's also challenged accepted views, both those of the uncritical layperson and practitioner, but also those of philosophers of science. And it's also led to a whole range of fruitful and interesting open problems, which indeed I think is one of the best things that a writer can do. Just to remind you what we've done, after an introduction, I stress some of, and explain some of Kuhn's key ideas from the structure of scientific revolutions. I then took you through Kuhn's path to these, how he came to these views. I discussed their reception. And finally, we discussed some of their implications and open problems. Thank you very much.